the objective of this um, uh, is to try and demonstrate how um, CCTRDs can actually develop and be established through collaboration uh, between the various stakeholders in any community. And from this, we are going to have uh, four speakers um, who are going to demonstrate to us how uh, the collaboration efforts have, have assisted in the growth of their CCTRDs from their uh, respective countries. Um, to start with, we are going to start with Gihan. Gihan is from uh, the diocese from uh, um, .lk and uh, basically it's here in the Asia Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific region. He's going to give us the um, a background of basically some of the activities they've engaged, how they've done the collaboration, how they've, they've structured their CCTLD uh, uh, setup. Uh, we're also going to get a presentation from Dr. Paulos Miranda from Malawi, uh, .mw, and also we'll get to get an experience of how the CCTLD there was established. Uh, we're also going to get a presentation also from um, uh, from uh, Rajesh Agrawal from Nixi, India, uh, which runs the .in, and um, also we're going to get an experience of how they've managed to make their CCTLD successful. We're also going to get a presentation from Dina Barakat, who is in um, Cairo, so she's going to do it remotely uh, using the online tools that have been presented for this session. And also, um, and also, we're going to get the experience basically from Egypt as well, how they, they are working towards making the CCTLD to be more successful. And then also, the last session, uh, the last speaker today will be um, uh, Eric from LAC TLD, uh, one of the co-organizers of this workshop. Um, this workshop is co-organized by AFTLD, um, Center, um, ISOC, um, LAC TLD, <coughs> and APTLD, basically the regional top level organizations that represent the CCTLDs in the various, uh, the five, re uh, the four regions. And um, um, Eric is going to talk about the experience that he has had in the past with the Latin American region. So we get to have a perspective from at least the three, the four major, uh, the four main regions in terms of how they manage to make their CCTLDs successful. Uh, my name is Avichuki Mwangi. I am uh, chair. Uh, I'm going to chair this session this morning, and I'm also the president of the African Top Level Domain So, without further ado, I'd like to invite um, Jihan to start off with the first presentation. Thank you. Avichuki, uh, let me just bring this up and hope it comes on the screen. Is it on one of the screens? Okay, thank you. And uh, as Michuki mentioned, I run the .lk domain, which is a fairly small domain, maybe around 8,000 uh, domains registered in Sri Lanka. And uh, so let me first of all bit about ourselves. We are known as the LK domain registry, but for historical reasons, as you know, this word Nick was there, so we also are known as LK Nick for short. And our main business is to register names in .lk top level domain, which is of course the country code for Sri Lanka. And we take the view that LK or .lk is meant for registering Lankan domains and whatever this means. So it's, we, we, we haven't really tried to very clearly pinpoint what we mean by Lankan domains, but we are not a GTLD and we do not really encourage everybody in the world coming and registering in .lk, although we don't really have any very strict policies for not allowing that either. Again, I want to just mention that obviously if we wanted to grow our domain in the sense of having many, many more names registered, then of course making it an open domain and getting people to just register would certainly make sense, but we decided not to do that. Again, it would depend on your experience. Uh, so let me give a bit of history. We were one of the early registries. Uh, we started in 1990, so well, not very early, but it was one of the early ones. And you know, it's one of these John Foster says, well, yeah, you run it type of things. And it's been housed at the University of Molotov, which is the main technical university in the country from its inception. But uh, so let me give a bit of history. So as we, when we started in 1990, we had 
maybe two domains or something like that and then we got another one in six months and another one in six months and it was you know very slow and <coughs> there was no issue then by about 1995 we realized okay we are getting some stream of registrations and we need to formalize this and we felt it was not correct to do it as a university since university is job is to teach students uh, and by the way I'm a professor there at the University of Mertua uh, and not necessarily registered domains so we turned to the government body called Council for Information Technology and asked them could you sort of help us to do this and the deal we struck with them was we'll continue registering the domains at Mertua so I think that's quite common in many cases but we decided to hand over the actual authority and the financial and the policy aspects to this government body called Syntec. And that ran for about eight years, up to 2003. And then in 2004, due to various reasons which I won't get into right now, uh, we decided to incorporate our registry as a non-profit company. Uh, and that was done in March 2004, so about four years ago. And one of the major things we did was to make sure we had stakeholder representation. So let me briefly explain our structure and maybe certainly during the discussion session we can discuss that. Uh, so as you said, we are a limited company incorporated under the Companies Act. And to be a limited company, and we are a limited, what we call a company limited by guarantee. So it's not a commercial company, it's a non-profit company, but we need members. And we took a decision that our membership will be small and it will be invited. So nobody can come and wave some money at us and say I want to become a member or they can go to the stock exchange and buy a share. Basically, uh, membership is by invitation, although really if somebody showed a genuine interest in joining, we probably would never say no. Uh, and the idea is that we want to have some constructive engagement with members rather than uh, having everybody coming in and you know various power blocks coming in and so on. So this was a conscious decision we made. It may not be appropriate for everybody, but I think it worked for us because our members really support us, although obviously they often come and criticize and things like that. Uh, but it's a, and, and all the members are individuals. So we do not have the government or any corporate body as members uh, of the society, of the company. Uh, however, we also have the board, which of course is the governing body. The membership of course just meets once a year and you know, this, they don't really have much of active day-to-day -day thing. And there, we decided that we need multi-stakeholders partnerships and so we have two members who represent the government of Sri Lanka one member nominated by the ICT agency of Sri Lanka which is the government body responsible for developing ICT uh, also since CCTLDs and ISPs are uh, within the area of telecom we also have a representative from the telecom regulatory commission and we go out of our way to make sure we have, we keep on good terms in the sense we have a very constructive engagement with both the ICT agency and the Telecom Regulatory Commission. Uh, and, and we've done that very, very uh, strongly. We do not feel that having any kind of adversary arrangement with these two would help. So, and in fact, even when I talk about the IDN, uh, for the, when we want to get onto the IDNs, we really did that through these two bodies uh, rather than trying to do anything ourselves. Uh, then, in addition to that, we have a member, of, uh, sorry, a director representing the ISPs in Sri Lanka who happens to be the chairman of the ISP association, who also happens to be our chairman. Then, we have a representative representing the internet users who is currently representing the Internet Society, Sri Lanka chapter, so to speak. Uh, then, in addition to those four people who represent various stakeholders, and also, sorry, I did not include that, but I'll just mention it. We have a representative from the University of Moratua, which is the place where the it is there, and that also helps because when we have operation issues, then we have a representative from the university 
Dr. Jackin, who's somewhere around, he's not in this room, uh, here. In fact, we have two of our directors here at IGF today. And uh, so we have those five directors representing specific stakeholders, plus we have three nominated experts. And these experts are nominated by our membership. Uh, they do not have to be members, although we really encourage them to become members. And uh, we have uh, a legal expert. We have a person who's been very senior person in the ICT industry, also happens to be a director of the ICT agency. And then we have another very senior person who has a lot of industry experience. So we have got people who are well respected in the area and bring the expertise to be on our board. So that's really uh, what we have done. And uh, before I get on to the next one, let me just explain. I think that's been very useful because within Sri Lanka, we have, obviously we have critics and people who complain, especially you know the normal thing saying he charged too much or you know, we are too slow or, or, or you know, why didn't you give me the domain I asked for? Uh, why all those normal issues are there, but we do find that uh, within the country, since we have a very good connection to the government as well as the private sector as well as the users, we find that we have a lot of stature within the country as well as, of course, outside. Uh, so the current situation is we are running the thing. It's physically at University of Morotua, but not really part of the university. The policy is developed by the board with government and industry input, and we periodically have consultations. Uh, very often we let either ICTA or TRC, for example, the recent consultation on IDNs was really handled by uh, the TRC and the ICTA. So we participated, so that way we get the input, but uh, not necessarily we, we as ourselves. Uh, and let me just very briefly, I won't take too much time on this. Uh, we have registrations both under .lk itself as well as under second level domains. And we have about, I mentioned four here, but we have three or four more open second level domains. Currently, we have only one closed second level, which is gov.lk, which obviously is open only to government organizations. Others are open to everybody. And as I said earlier, we tend to direct our marketing and uh, activities towards people in Sri Lanka. We don't prevent people from outside Sri Lanka from registering, but we do not, shall I say, take a very active promotion attitude towards them. Uh, we have several packages, and let me just mention something which we thought was a bit unique uh, in a CCTLD. Uh, we have special rates for two-letter domains since we felt that those were more attractive than longer domains, so they cost more. And three-letter domains cost less than uh, two-letter domains, but still more than other domains. Um, I wouldn't say that's been hugely successful, but they do bring us a bit more revenue. Uh, and basically, we have a standard first-come, first-served type of policy. Uh, one interesting thing is we have no real-time registration. And uh, that's not because of any technical reason why we couldn't have a, you know, any kind of registration system running. Uh, we felt that due to our situation in Sri Lanka, we wanted to make sure there's a bit of a firewall or an air gap between the request coming in and it actually getting into the database. So each request is checked manually, but generally we provide same day registration and if somebody has an urgent request, we can do it in an hour or so. Uh, unless, and if there are issues with any particular name, generally we refer it back to the applicants, and usually without you know, making any formal deny. We, we hardly ever formally deny a name. Uh, well, I would say hardly ever, but it's, it's fairly unusual. Uh, we just refer it back to them and say, well, maybe you want to think a bit more about this, and this is the reason why we suggest that, and then often that happens. So why do we do not have an automatic registration, or automated registration? One is security concerns. We are a bit worried that people might register certain domains which the government might have issues with, so 
we, we don't want to do that. Also, we don't want people to register offensive uh, directory names, and it's really impossible to try and uh, stop that with automated system. And also, we do not consider cyber squatting to be a desirable thing. I know some CCDLDs don't share that view. We do. Uh, so we use this system to discourage cyber squatting. Uh, and we have certain names which are disallowed, and I will go through them one by one, but names of provinces and towns and so on are not allowed to be registered. And any other names which, according to the Companies Act, are not allowed in a company name, including the word Sri Lanka, because that's really reserved for uh, government organizations, and so on. Uh, before I conclude, let me briefly talk about IDNs. So Sri Lanka, like many of our countries, has more than one language. We have three languages, a Sinhala, which about 70% of the people speak, Tamil, which about 30% speak, and English, which is spoken by very few people. Uh, and obviously, ev everybody who speaks English would speak one of the other two. But uh, just like in India here, and in several other countries, people can read English letters. So because of that, IDNs were not really a major, major issue in Sri Lanka. Uh, but now we have a lot of government initiatives for introducing local language in the country. So all government institutes must have uh, websites in all three languages. And then, of course, if the websites are in all three languages or in, in various languages, then why is the name coming in English? So we decided to set up IDNs. We started a task force. As I said, uh, ICT and PRC started the task force, and I was uh, asked to chair the task force. And uh, we were basically asked to look at the issues you know, surrounding CCTLD, sorry, uh, IDN labels in our two languages, and also to identify the TLD labels, top level domain labels, and we looked at the labels for the GTLDs as well as the CCTLDs. And one of the things we did recently, and we are about to launch it under this fast track program, is identified the IDN labels for our two languages, Sinhala and Tamil. And uh, our decision is to basically use the name of the country. So in uh, Sinhala, it would be Lanka and in Tamil it would be Ilangay as the top level domain. So we decided not to go for any abbreviation, you know, two letters or something like that. And again, I would like some feedback from you on your countries, whether you feel that uh, you should go for the full name of the country. Obviously, different countries have names which are varying in length or what the best solution would be. And as I said, we are planning to join the idea fast track. Okay, so since we are short of time, I will conclude the presentation now. And questions would be again. If we have any questions of clarity, we can take one or two as the next speaker sets up. My question maybe would be how many domain names do you have today? We have about 8,000 names registered, so it's pretty small uh, compared to some other institutions. Okay. Yeah, start. Okay. And good morning. Um, my name is Paulus Miranda. I'm from Malawi. Um, and I'll be looking at the issue of access um, as regards to CCTOD growth and development um, with examples from Malawi. Um, we have uh, um, another workshop uh, tomorrow um, around the world in eight CCTODs. And in that workshop, I'll also be presenting uh, the case for Malawi where we will talk more uh, in detail about our setup and governance structure. So for today, I'll be looking at role of access um, in CCTOD growth and development um, in line with the um, topic for this workshop. 
around the uh, meeting uh, in the this week I've often been asked what is a CCTLD and um, I've actually talked to quite a few people and the latest was yesterday at lunch um, CCTLD uh, often is very difficult to define even within the CCTLD but for my purposes this morning I will think of a CCTLD as an entity that manages and operates domain names um, on the internet top level domain. So .lk, um, my colleague from Sri Lanka. Um, and this TLD is identified with a particular country or territory. The so-called country court uh, as listed in the um, UN lists. So .mw for Malawi, .in for India, different from .com. And because it is targeting a specific community, there are certain uh, issues that uh, CCTLDs deal with or uh, handle on a day-to-day -day basis. And today, I'll be looking mostly at access. Um, as the previous speaker has indicated access is a major issue for CCTLDs. CCTLDs don't just deal with internet access, but we have to look at other issues as well. We have to look at policy for CCTLD. Uh, we support a community within the territory. We have to look at support. And very often, uh, these need different types of access, not just internet access. CCDLDs operate websites where register, people can register domains. We operate registries, and as I'll show later, we often operate multiple registrars. We operate servers also uh, through uh, internet connections. In our operations, our operations involve coordinated processes and activities, and many of these take place online but not all of them take place online. So um, when we look at access, we need to look at um, both scenarios. Um, registrants often need to search for information. They need to evaluate the information. information. They need to evaluate information. OK. Um, People need to view the policies okay, of uh, the domain and and they need to look at processes on how to register a domain and they need quite process and they need quite process on how to register a domain on how to register a domain. <laughs> I, I like it. <laughs> People, when they access uh, domain services, they need to search for information. They need to look at what your policy is, what your prices are, whether you take domains by um, email, uh, and like my previous uh, colleague has indicated, whether you take them uh, on a paper card. Uh, how long does it take for you to actually process it? Um, so they need to view your policies and processes uh, for domain registration. They need to make updates on their domains. They need to make payments. And they need to make um, um, few actions in order to maintain their domain. So access to these services is a major issue for CCTLDs and for the registrants or clients of the uh, domains. How a CCTLD grows or uh, a measure of performance is usually the size of the CCTLD, the number of domains that um, you have in the registry, as well as the rate at which you take the registrations. So when we look at uh, access issues, uh, most of the access issues uh, are similar to uh, access issues for internet networks and services. 
because most of the services uh, run online. So we can look at infrastructure, availability of connections, affordability or cost, reliability, and so forth. Um, however, unlike normal internet connections, CCTLD need, CCTLDs need to look at policy, regulation, awareness in the country, um, capacity. And in such cases, access enables registrants to go through processes of registration uh, of uh, a domain. And this process needs to reach an endpoint in a timely manner. So speed is an issue. Um, very often, um, in our countries, especially in mine, um, as I will show later, our users face major obstacles to access the services uh, of the CCTLD. When we look at the obstacles and burdens that they face, um, they are on the usual issues, infrastructure, power, how available is the domain, how, how much downtime uh, do you face, and so forth. And these obstacles and burdens uh, do frustrate registrants. And if registrants get frustrated, they may migrate to a GTLD, uh, God forbid. Um, so when we look at uh, these um, uh, obstacles and burdens, if in our community the obstacles and burdens are selective, one part of the country does not have as good access as another part of the country, then issues of fairness come up and the CCTLD may be um, um, uh, observed as favoring one section of the community versus uh, another. And we need to make sure that um, all parts of the community have um, equal access to the services of the CCTLD. In particular for African CCTLDs, this is a major issue in Malawi. Less than 3% of the population have internet access. They face major problems and obstacles as I've already highlighted. Uh, most African CCTLDs have less than 10,000 domains. And here we can worry about what is the critical mass for a domain to be well developed and to be sustainable. And I think that 10,000 is not enough. So we would benefit from improved access for potential registrants in many of the developing countries so that we can reach a critical mass and to be sustainable. Um, so access to CCTLD sites, to CCTLD information, to services and support, this needs to improve. Um, we did a little bit of survey for African CCTLDs under the uh, Africa Top Level Domain Organization, AFTLD. Um, and I'll just highlight one or two issues that showed up in that research. When you, register, when you need to register a domain in a CCTLD, usually you access a website. So these websites are listed uh, at IANA, and you go there, you say, this is where I can uh, register the CCTLD, um, and then you can access that website. Um, usually there is policy there, there are prices, um, and other things. We measured how many of African countries actually do have a website where you can access the services of the CCTLD. And this data here shows that about half of African countries still don't have a working website. So the communities in those countries do face uh, problems in accessing the services of the CCTLD online uh, because there is no such um, access point. Um, my colleague has highlighted that um, we can't take paper subscriptions, so it doesn't mean that the service is not there. It just means that 
the service may be slow and uh, rate of registrations may be slow. We looked at whether these, for those that have uh, such uh, websites, whether the websites work um, or not, and in quite a few countries, although a website is listed, it doesn't work, or it is pointing to a location that does not actually provide CCTLP services. So it is bad. Many of the uh, CCTLP still operate single point registries, um, and as we can see here, uh, only about 10 of the 50 or so African countries provide multiple access um, for CCTLP domain registrations. Um, it means that the issue of access um, on competition is, is a major issue. Competition drives prices um, down. In terms of support for technical services, uh, we looked at how the community can access uh, support uh, for technical services. And we found that quite a few African countries, um, in this case representing developing countries, um, still have their technical support outside the country. Um, if you go to the CCTLD, uh, to the AFTLD website, AFTLD.org, you can actually look at more details of this data. And we found that the major majority of out of country technical support, um, those who are outside the country, many of them are in the US, uh, some are in Switzerland, uh, Canada, Germany, Portugal, Sweden, and we have one case where the CCTLD um, within Africa is operating technical services in an other African country in South Africa. In looking at this data, um, we see that there are strong, still strong colonial links um, in the operations. And my colleague uh, yesterday or two days ago um, commented on reparations. Uh, he said it's controversial. So in order to bootstrap the growth and development of CCTLDs, uh, many African countries um, in the Africa region have a small rate of registrations and they have small number of domains. Um, they haven't reached critical mass. Access is a major issue for potential registrants and it is a major issue to grow these uh, sizes and rates. Um, improving access will improve registrations and retention of domains as people become more efficient in managing their domains, handling payments. We need to reach a critical mass at some point and maybe if we do that, we can compete better with GTLDs. The, under the FTLD, we're carrying out new research uh, project, which is designed to look at the uptake of CCTLDs in African countries um, compared with uptake of GTLDs. Okay, that's my presentation, and this is my home, um, where you can register a domain under uh, .mw, as I indicated. Um, we have another session where I'll be talking about the governance structure for our domain, but you can have a look uh, at our site. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paulus. Um, uh, Mr. Paul, during your presentation, you mentioned something like uh, when um, a registrant uh, frustrated, he might migrate to GLTD. I don't know what does that mean. 
Uh, and secondly, could you tell us uh, as to how many domain names are registered in your country? Thank you. Paulus, you mentioned that uh, the two main challenges are awareness and access to the internet services. Uh, is cost an issue in Malawi because of the domain name? Thank you very much, um, uh, for Minister, for the uh, question. Um, GTLBs are the alternatives that um, um, where you can register domains. So, uh, for example, you have something like .com, which is. Uh, probably one of the biggest GTLDs. Uh, it is not a country code. Um, it is uh, a generic top level domain. Um, and many um, of our companies um, in developing countries are registered under .com. Um, there is um, perception of competition uh, within communities of uh, registrations between GTLDs, the generic top-level domains that run all over the world, like .com, .net, um, and so forth, and the specific community or country-based CCTLDs uh, or top-level domains like .mw or for Namibia .na. Um, so um, while .na is specifically uh, assigned to the Namibian community and you can develop policy for it to open it to other communities as well. But you welcome registrations from others, uh, others as well, uh, except for our government domains, .gov, .mw, uh, which is restricted to the government of Malawi. So GTLDs, uh, the generic top-level uh, top domains um, that are open to everyone, that are run on commercial basis, that don't have specific country policy. Um, in Malawi, we still have a small number of domains. We have about 10,000 domains. And at the moment, we are handling about 20 transactions per day, um, which uh, is quite significant for a CIS, small CCTLD. So we see ourselves as being pushed quite a bit on how we can ac provide access to all the 10,000 domains and how we can run the 20 or so transactions per day. Um, many of these coming from within Malawi, but uh, there are many also that come from uh, registrants who are outside uh, our CCTLD, our country. Has that? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, awareness is a major issue. Um, and in Malawi, it is actually also a major issue. We run workshops um, to bring up awareness. The issue of cost is a major debate in our uh, workshops. And uh, .mw domains are charged at $50 each. Uh, whether you are in Malawi or you are outside. Um, the discussions in our community show that um, cost is not a major barrier. Um, but is a major barrier. But, um, but the other access issues um, are much more significant the other access than, issues than are cost. much more significant than and and because this is because um, the new registrants that are looking for a domain are usually coming from an ISP. And what they pay to the ISP is much, much higher than what they pay for a domain. Um, and so a domain represents only a small additional charge on what they want to do. Uh, and what, what we find in our consultations in the country is that at $50 a year, for $4 a month, because we allow people to pay 
on a month-to-month -month basis if you are within Malawi, uh, which is not open if you are coming from outside. At $4 or so uh, a month, it is minimal compared to the $2,000 or $3,000 that you pay a month for a one megabit <coughs> per second connection. Okay, that's a question, and then can we hold the question at the back? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. The, it's just a follow-up, or rather clarity, on the payment. Is it a one-off payment? Is it a, a, a quarter kind of payment where you keep your domain sustained by your payment every year? That's one. Uh, the second question is, in your presentation, you, you spoke about the speed, and the speed indeed is, is, is a question uh, that has been prevailing in many, many you know, countries. What determines the speed? I think that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Permit for a domain are um, in, in Malawi, and I think in many of the other CCTLDs, are on an annual basis. Um, so we charge for a domain $50 uh, per year. And uh, as I indicated, in Malawi we offer flexibility for Malawians, but not for outsiders. So if you're registering a domain with us, we send you an invoice up front, you pay your um, um, registration fee, and we activate the domain for you. Um, for Malawians, we, ask, we allow them to pay um, on a month-to-month -month basis, but for each domain, the $50 should be paid up by the end of the year, by December 31. Um, so, uh, and these, these are calendar months, uh, because we generate our invoices um, uh, on a particular month of the year. So. Um, we have we offer flexibility on on payments for our community. Um, speed, yes, is a major issue, and when you're looking at services that run on the internet, speed can be thought of in two formats. Uh, this is the speed of the connection that you use to access the registry, um, but I was also referring to the speed at which. When you start the process of registering a domain, when do you reach the end point? And for us, this is a major issue. We guarantee two days, 48 hour working hours um, for, for a domain. When it is registered and approved by us, we have an approval process. Um, and between that time and the time that the domain is actually active and resolvable on the internet, Two days is a long time. GTLDs offer you only a few seconds. Um, so um, CCDLDs, many CCDLDs um, are a little bit slower than uh, most of the GTLDs. Thank you. Thank you, Paulos. Um, now I'm going to give this opportunity to Rajesh Agro to speak to us on Nixie and dot .in. Okay. Good morning, friends. Um, we had three fascinating questions, and so I will change the sequence of my thoughts and start by responding to them. How is a CCTLD better or faster than a general top-level domain like .com. First, domain market is a volume-driven market. The fixed cost is very high. And so, the new CCTLDs, the country domain names, can't match in pricing to big players like .com or to .biz or .info. So we find that pricing of many country domain names is much higher than .com. 
Even in India, our pricing for dot .in is about $10 to the registrars, which is much higher than about $3 rate for dot .com in India. Still, why do people go for country domain names? First reason is very simple, that cyber squatters have beaten, taken all the good names, even for small companies in countries. So when a CCTLD is launched, these small companies under the sunrise period get a chance to register the name and uh, save it from the cyber squatters. So that has happened in .in also. Then second, does it mean faster access? Yes, in most of the cases, if you keep the registry servers and also connect the DNS servers to the exchange points, etc., it does result, uh, result in faster access to the country code level domains. Again, in three exchange points, we have connected our registry DNS servers to the exchange points. So many ISPs deliver .in domain names very, very quickly. Third point is, do the country domain names, do they result in better local content? Here the answer is debatable, but when we analyze .in content, we find that yes, it has resulted in many companies content coming and many organizations and individuals content coming, which was not there on .com or other places. Fourth, the help in arbitration, etc. Now in .com, if an Indian company has to save its name in .com, the costing could be three, four thousand dollars. While to save its domain name in .in by going into our arbitration process, it costs about two hundred dollars. So having a local robust country domain name helps uh, businesses in this way. So better protection, faster access, easier availability of name, and so on. Now should we reduce the dot uh, country code domain name cost to encourage it further? Last year, one year back, we had 250,000 domain names. So we thought to play with the price. We reduced price for six months from about $10 to $2 for the registrars, 80% cut. And the volumes went five times high. Now the two questions come. Now first year of that promo period just started last month and we, were, we have been closely monitoring the renewal rate. Our normal renewal rate is 80%. So from pure business point of view for the registry, if my renewal rate for cheaper promo period domain names is lower than 40%, then I have uh, in fact lost revenue. But if it is about 50-60%, as a business I have got more business to the .in registry. Luckily the renewal rate doesn't seem to have dropped very drastically. It seems to have dropped from 80% to 70%. So that means that once the people get even a cheap domain name, and next year renewal is at the regular price. So we are not seeing many dropouts. So once people get a good name, they continue with it. However, second trend we observed in lowering the price was issues of domain testing and higher rate of cyber squatting. So how much quality to sacrifice for the sake of quantity, that's a big debate now going on within our advisory council also. And based on this, probably next year we are going to reduce the prices, but not by drastic levels. Probably comparable to dot-com levels. So that's the issue of costing uh, as far as dot-in is concerned. Now just to give a little bit of history of dot-in, from 1995 to 2004, it was run by a government company called CDAC. There were too many restrictions. You had to actually do a lot of paperwork with them. Then once they approve, you had to send them a check. Then once the check is encashed, they would give you domain name. 
So the process would take four, five, six months. The result was at the end of 2004, we just had 6,000 names. And the infrastructure was not robust. In 2004 monsoons, the registry servers kept in Mumbai on the ground floor somewhere. They got flooded and all 6,000 names uh, were not resolving. So from 1st January 2005, the government of India re-delegated it to Nixie. Nixie is a not-for-profit company, a multi-stakeholder body, where board of director consists of three government nominees, one academia, and 10 members of the internet service providers. So the majority is from the industry. Simultaneously, the policies were liberalized. The reserve name list was drastically pruned. And the method was to give the domain names through registrars. So at that time, about 10 local and uh, global registrars were appointed to sell the domain names. And in the three month sunrise period, we tested a figure of 70,000 names. So currently we have about 500,000 names and about 50 registrars. We have a reasonably good uh, arbitration policy in place. Recently, we reduced the arbitration price from about $500 to $200. That has resulted in slight increase in the number of complaints coming. And uh, so that's a good sign that uh, reduction in arbitration price has helped people uh, save their names. And the challenges we current are tackling are false sewage data. We see false sewage data in a lot of names. So we are coming up with some new policies on that. On domain testing, when we reduced the prices, we saw this trend, which was not there earlier. So we have uh, already set the domain testing policy in place, which is absolutely parallel to what ICANN has recommended. And that has seen practically vanishing of any domain testing now. Beyond 10% uh, names tested, we don't uh, re uh, refund the fees to the registrar. So now they are very careful. And another trend which we need to stop and uh, on which we have still not taken any action is name grabbing by registrars themselves. First is uh, new names which are grabbed. Second is names which are dropping out due to some reason. The registrar fails to pay the price, etc., renewal price. And the name is taken by the registrar and then basically sold off at a much higher price. So again, this is one thing we are still working on, how to tackle it. So we are involving even the registrars in dis discussions on these issues, how to tackle this. We are involving the community in this. Especially we are in touch with Linux community. Our interaction with Linux community also started on IDNs. On IDNs, again, we have challenge of 22 official languages. Uh, that's one. I can't launch uh, one language ahead of the others. Uh, we'll face legal and political challenges in that. Second is, do we launch IDNs at second level within .in, or do we wait for ICANN to give us top level domain names, .bharat, etc., in various languages? And if you see the info guide, which was in the, your kit bag, on the last page of info guide, you will see dot bharat written in about 20 indian languages so we hope to launch most of them parallelly when i can open its application process so we have 11 scripts and 22 languages and i hope to launch at least seven eight uh, languages as soon as i can open its application process for top level domains in idn i think i will stop here we are running out of time and we have friend from Bijip also trying to join in so any questions till so far? Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned something very interesting, which uh, your predecessor didn't mention, mention their pre presentations like uh, uh, arbitration. Um, I think it's a recourse to the 
for the, the customers if, if, if they are aggrieved. But I wanted to find out whether now um, a country domain uh, name organizations, uh, who regulate them? Are they regulated uh, by, I mean, to ensure that they are providing uh, a good value for money, service to their customers, not overcharging, uh, or are they regulated by the um, regulators in their respective countries, or how they operate without having uh, a, a, an organization who does the uh, oversight uh, responsibility over what they do? Thank you. Okay. I can sign contracts with GTLDs only, like .com, .info, .biz. They are regulated by ICANN. All the CCTLDs, because these are run by sovereign countries, either by their governments or by bodies chosen by them. So ICANN does not give any rules or contracts to CCTLDs. So each country is free to choose its own policies. Most of them go with ICANN best practice policies, but on the pricing, we see very different structures. On reserved names, we see very different structures. For example, Malaysia does not allow the World Bank or government to come in a domain name. If the word government comes in a domain name, then you can't uh, basically get that domain name without getting approval of the Malaysian ministry. Similarly for bank. So we had discussion on that in .in. Because a lot of government sites we see are seemingly government sites are held by cyber squatters. So the general consensus which is, which is emerging is probably the government world could be sort of reserved within the domain name. But bank, for example, Question Bank, Children Knowledge Bank, even these sites would get stuck in bureaucracy. So on that, uh, we are quite liberal. On arbitration also, we see a lot of uh, differences in countries. And I guess now dot in price of $200 arbitration price and guaranteed judgment within two months. Uh, it's one of the lowest in the world at the moment. That's my guess. Can, can, can I go? Question? Do we have a question over there. Can we first go there? Okay. On the left side. Okay, I'm Shashani from Dot IR Registry. Um, these are really comments about the three speakers. First of all, this morning the statistics, the quarterly statistics of Verisign came out, and I suggest that everybody looks at them because it shows one of the myths that exist about GTLDs and CCTLDs are not true. Outside the United States, there are more CCTLDs used than GTLDs. In fact, the number of CCTLDs used outside the United States is exactly 65 million and the number of GTLDs is 42 million. That's about the ratio of one and a half, really. So, the, uh, whatever you know, impediments exist, I think the lesson we get from this is that if you act wisely, the CCTLDs really have, can grow, and can grow better maybe than GTLDs for a number of reasons. One of the important reasons is the legal protection that you stated. I think that's one of the important factors. And now, just for statistics, I looked at the three registries that gave uh, presentations today. Now, um, Dal K said they have about 8,000 registrations. In uh, Sri Lanka, there are almost 10,000 GTLTs registered, which is about the same. In India, both are about 500,000, so it's about level. And in Malawi, Malawi, I'm surprised because the gentleman said they have about 10,000 registrations and he was complaining about, you know, not being able to compete with GTLDs. And according to the statistics I just looked up, there are only 665 GTLDs registered in Malawi. So apparently the CCTLD in Malawi is doing much better than the GTLDs are doing. So whatever factors exist that impede the growth of the CCTLD are doing probably more harm to the GTLDs there. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> should, should I go on, sir? Yeah. Yeah, 
question over here, please. Okay. Um, my, my question is, is very straightforward. Um, it's, it's the capacity of a domain to handle uh, the, the volume of registry, I mean, of, of subscribers, registrations, for example. Um, by this, I mean, does the, I mean, the, 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 the how many registration of, of, of subscribers on a particular domain have any effect in terms of, of okay, let's, let's forget about pricing. Does that got any, any effect in terms of handling the traffic, say, once they register their, 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 their domain, domains? Does it have an effect on that? Yeah, you would answer that? The volume, how many they are? You mean uh, the number of, 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 of the software. system, the average system? Yes. Yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, .NK is quite small, and we really had no issues with the capacity of the registry system. Uh, I believe even with like 500,000, I, I wouldn't see any issues. It's only when we get up to millions that oh, I guess okay. we would have an issue. I, I, I don't see capacity of the actual hardware or the software being an issue for almost anyone. Um, I think, especially for renewals, the capacity of our internal processors to send out renewal notices and keep track of them. That's something we found uh, a bit, that our capacity was being a bit strained, so we needed to increase uh, capacity there. Because unlike new re registrations, which people come and do it, renewals, we need to send out renewal notices, and uh, sometimes we found that that was not quite happening. Oh, okay, thank okay. you. Okay, last one as we move to the next. Uh, this is kind of a general question for all of you. Were you, or did? Okay. Sorry, Eric has. Then I will go there. And no. okay. <laughs> oh, you can ask the question, Bill. Oh. And then, uh, um, I was going to ask uh, what each of you see as the barriers to DNSSEC signing uh, for your TLD zones. Uh, whether you're considering it, if so, how soon, and. Uh, what difficulties you see standing between you and, and completing that? That's an interesting question. Uh, most of the CCTLDs are waiting for uh, some GTLD to sign it first, I guess. But on .in, we had a lot of discussions. Uh, our technical service provider, as you know, is Affiliates, and uh, we have involved uh, Steve Crocker also with our effort. So we have already signed two names, though it's very it's only symbolic value, Crocker.in and Steve Crocker.in. These two <laughs> domain names are not DNS signed, and we are actively working on introducing a DNS test dot in test zone by 15th of December. We have three, four ISPs ready to put those kind of resolvers in place, and three, four distrars basically ready to handle that. So I guess that experiment will go on for about two months. Parallelly, gov.in, this uh, subzone, which is handled only by one government registrar, and which has only about 6,000 names, uh, this we intend to sign first. And then our timeline is, by March or so, do with the, all the experimentation, and then sign dot in. That's the timeline for us. As far as Dr. K is concerned, we haven't really addressed the problem too much. So I think what we can say at this point is 